Thank you. I'll begin. No, Father, we uh, thank you for today. I thank you again for these students for the weekend just completed. Pray you be uh, with us today. Help us to glorify you in what we do, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. So I'm going to start class um, by telling you a little bit of the additional theory, and then I'll, I'll try to leave the last 15 minutes or so of class for your questions about the mission, all right? That's my plan. So let me get to it. Um, a critical, so we're going to look at a function of two variables. I'm going to try to describe to you why the, the second derivative test is true, and then give you examples of how it's applied to functions, all right? It's going to be a good week. I can feel it. Let's see here. So a critical point is one for which the second, uh, excuse me, the first derivative with respect to x and y of the function at the point is zero. All right. So in that context, the you know the basically the, the power series multivariate power series expansion um, of f looks something like this. Right. This is like the best quadratic approximation to the function, and this piece over here would be cubic or quartic or quintic pieces. I mean, it'd be higher order data. Um, so close to the critical point, it stands to reason that this quadratic piece, which I've called the Hessian, um, should dominate. All right. And then we d I, I gave you this Uber example last time, showing you that if you wanted to decide where a h squared plus 2 b h k plus c k squared is like minimized or maximized on a circle, like a little circle of radius r, it comes down to looking at the characteristic equation, lambda squared minus a plus c lambda plus this thing equal to zero. So I can look at this as it relates to this specific quadratic form where the values of the constants, the a, the b, and the c, relate to the second derivatives of the function. So I'm just literally <coughs> piggybacking, piggybacking the, the Hessian thing with my Uber example of last time and identifying a is one half the second derivative, b is uh, one half the mixed derivative, and c is one half the second, second y derivative. And then I just sort through the analysis, basically. Um, Seems like some kind of narrow toe joke here. Let's see here. Let's see here. We lambda. Well, let me just run through it. If both lambda one and lambda two share the same sign, then we can be sure that the that the Hessian is greater than uh, the, the the tail of it, since the tail depends on third and higher order pieces. All right, the, and and the Hessian depends on the much larger quadratic pieces near the origin. And I say origin, but uh, well, yeah, the origin would be h and k both zero, which corresponds to the point x not y not. All right. Um, if you, as you read the, the setup here, if we had both, um, if we had, uh, excuse me, um, so if I have both of them positive, that implies a local minimum. If both the eigenvalues, these lambda solutions to the characteristic equation are negative, it implies a local maximum. On the other hand, if you've got one positive and one negative, right, if they, and I'm, I'm just assuming that lambda one's a smaller one, um, then that means that the, the function's decreasing off the uh, critical point, and it's also increasing in the other direction off the critical point. So that's a saddle. All right. Um, on the other hand, if, if either one of the eigenvalues are zero, then we don't really know because the, the, the quadratic piece just looks like a uh, sort of a trough, a parabolic trough near the critical point. But then the, the third order corrections might bend the trough up or might bend the trough down. We can't know. So the, the, the second derivative test is, is silent in the case that either the eigenvalues are zero. So what does that actually look like? I mean, we don't care about eigenvalues in here. We care about derivatives um, more so. So I'm just going to sort through what I just said translates to second derivatives. Um, so here's the thing from the Uber example. Plugging in what a, b, and c are for the Hessian gives us this. And so you look at this, and you're like, well, all right, so what's the deal? This is going to be, if this thing is zero, right? Well, excuse me, um, let's see here, a few cases to consider. Let me actually let my notes do the work rather than trying to redo the notes here. A couple cases. Case one, you could have that the absolute value, um, well, if, if d is, d, d is going to be this thing in here, all right? Um, no, excuse me, d is this thing right here, fxx times fyy minus fxy squared. Um, so this, 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 uh, this animal right here, which happens to be the determinant of the Hessian if you look at it as a, as a matrix, but that's a separate thing. Um, anyway, um, linear algebra aside, this quantity, if we look at that, basically fixes what's going to happen because if this is less than zero 
if you look at this, right, um, let's see, this, this right here is D, right? See that? This term right here appearing in the characteristic equations D. So if this is less than zero, I've got something squared, right? Minus a minus gives me plus, plus something squared, right? So it's pretty, pretty clear that this is going to be positive because it's the square root of something that's positive. Well, um, I guess I shouldn't say that. I mean, it's clear that it's less than something. Let's see. This inequality indicates that the radical dominates the sign of the solution. So if d is less than zero, we have that. Um, oh, OK, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm an idiot. What's the point of this inequality? It's that it tells you what happens to the, the, the root up here, right? If this piece is necessarily smaller than that piece in terms of its magnitude, that means you've got one plus from the plus plus, and you've got one minus because when you put the minus in, this is larger in magnitude than that, so it wins. Right? So we have one plus, we have one minus in this situation. In the case d is less than zero, we have one plus, one minus. In other, ca in other words, we have a saddle-shaped graph near the critical point. All right? If d is greater than zero, well, then it's clear that this radical is smaller than that. Right? Wait a minute. Come on. <sighs> right? I mean, look at this. Come on, guys. So I'm, I'm taking this and I'm subtracting something that's necessarily positive, right? Because d, again, is this term. So I'm, you know, it would be like something squared minus something. Is this, is this less, is, is this, is this, is, is this inequality is bogus, right? Agree? Like if this is, if this is 25, right? Suppose that is uh, 5 squared, and this is 1, then we're looking at square root of 25 versus the square root of 21. I mean, come on. Clearly the square root of 25 is larger, which is what I want, because I want this to dominate the solution, right? So what this would say, if this is larger than that, it means in the, in the, if we go back to the past page, the, the characteristic equations are totally governed, the sign of them is governed by the first piece because it wins the radical. And so either this is positive, so they're both roots are positive, or this is negative, so both roots are negative. In other words, if D is positive, we either have a local minimum when this is positive, or we have a local maximum when that's positive. When that's, po when that's negative, rather. <sighs> Words. This is just like the second derivative from calculus one, right? If we have a critical point and we have the second derivative is negative, we have a local maximum, right? If we have a critical point and we have the second derivative positive, we've got a local minimum, right? I always think about y equals x squared versus y equals minus x squared as your sort of quintessential examples, right? x squared, y prime prime is 2, like that, local min, right? Minus x squared has y prime prime equal minus 2. It, it goes down like that, right? Finally, if d is equal to 0, then either lambda plus is zero or lambda minus is zero, and so the quadratic data is inconclusive. All right. So just collecting my thoughts, here's the standard second derivative test that you guys need to know. Um, so that, that's just, I'm just driving the second derivative test for you. I'm, I, I hope you're not too bothered that I took some class time to do that. Um, a lot of times this is just presented as sort of a mystical black box equation that Calc 3 students use. And I understand why people do that, because it's kind of a pain to explain it. But, um, and the proof you find in a lot of textbooks isn't terribly enlightening. I've tried to tie it to a larger discussion, which generalizes to more dimensions. Like, you can calculate the Hessian for functions of three or four or five variables. The trouble is finding the eigenvalues becomes a problem of linear algebra. It's only in the two-dimensional case that the uh, linear algebra is so friendly that we can give you formulas. All right. But conceptually, there's nothing stopping you from going to higher dimensions. It's just calculationally onerous. So if we have a function with a critical point, and it's a smooth function, um, if this, this d, which is sometimes called the Hessian, the second derivative of x, second derivative of y, minus the mixed derivative squared, all right, three cases, if the Hessian is less than 0, it's not a local extreme. In other words, the critical point is, in fact, what we call a saddle point. Um, if d is positive, and the second derivative with respect to x is greater than 0, but this is, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Most books use this, but you can see you could also use the second derivative of y being positive as a condition here if you look back, sort through the math. 
actually, if any sum of fx, if you have like fxx plus fyy is positive, that, that's also a good condition. I mean, there's a lot of different conditions you could tack on to the d greater than zero, but the standard one to give is that second derivative with respect to x is positive. That implies local minimum. If d is positive and the second derivative negative, that implies local maximum. All right. Any questions before I... I have three examples to illustrate each of the cases. Right? Yeah. It should be local extreme, not local extrema, right? Because it, isn't extreme a plural? Um, sure. I don't know. I use, uh, that's a good question. Uh, is extrema plural? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'll the question just, is, uh, should it be extreme or extremo? I'll leave the grammar to you guys. Um, all right, so here, here's an example. Suppose um, f of xy is x squared plus 2xy plus 2y squared, right? Um, we look at the gradient, all right? And if you look at that, plugging in 0 gives me 0, 0, right? So the origin is a critical point. Then I can calculate the second derivatives here. They're all constant as it happens. fxx is 2 fxy, 2, fyy, 4. So I can calculate the Hessian then, which is fxx, fyy, minus fxy squared. 8 minus 4 equals 4. Oh, there, there's another one of them, Sam. Um, so this is a, it's supposed to be greater than, but it's actually a wrangle, um, <laughs> which is right angle bracket in LaTeX, sorry. Yeah, I should, this is, a, this is a offensive to those who like tech and, um, it's just very wrong. But um, <laughs> questions? No? Okay. Um, now, the second derivative here is positive. We have the d is positive, so we get a local minimum by the, the second derivative test. Right? Okay. Is d always fx times fyy minus fx? Right. In this section, we define d to be that quantity. Is d always that? Well, no. In differential equations, I usually use d as like the derivative operator. Um, d is a lot of different things, a lot of different places. But here, it means exactly that. Yeah. And I will. I also call that the Hessian. I would say, technically, it's the determinant of the Hessian matrix, but we usually just call it the Hessian. Um, here's another one. So fxy minus x squared plus 2xy minus 2y squared. Calculate the gradient. The origin, again, is a critical point. Calculate your second derivatives. fxx is minus 2, fxy is 2, fyy is minus 4. These are very friendly examples because you can't get confused about plugging in the critical point, like evaluation of the second derivatives here. There's no, I mean, they're constant functions, so like evaluate them at the point. Well, oh well. <laughs> um, so your Hessian is 8 minus 4, which is 4, which is positive. But this case has the second derivative being less than 0. Consequently, f of 0, 0 is a local maximum by the second derivative test. Any, any questions so far? Third, third example. If we have fxx, fxy rather, x squared plus 2xy plus y squared, right? Then the gradient of f is 2x plus 2y, 2x plus 2y. The origin is again a critical point, all right? So we can use a theorem to d determine the nature of the critical point, calculate my second derivatives, 2, 2, 2. Man, this, this example is very, uh, very symmetrical. Um, and then you calculate the Hessian, you get 2 times 2, which is 4, minus 2 squared, which is also known as 4. So Hessian, 0. So this is the case where the, the second derivative test is silent. Just like in calculus 1, when you have the second derivative is 0, you don't get to say anything from the second derivative test, right? You had to check third and fourth derivatives to decide what happens. Which are 
but you probably weren't taught that, right? There is a higher derivative test based on like just looking at the Taylor series. If the third derivative is the first derivative that's non-zero, it's a saddle. If the fourth derivative is the, is the first derivative which appears non-trivially at a critical point, then it's a local maximum. If the fourth derivative is negative, it's a local minimum. If the fourth derivative is positive, and so forth. There's always this even odd uh, tower of derivative tests that you're not taught. Anyway, stopping to talk, I'll, I'll stop talking about calculus one that you know you did, were not that you were uh, you were robbed of. Um, let's just look at the last three examples. Picture, picture time. So again, third example had Hessian zero. Um, that's because the third example is exactly x plus y squared, which if you look at z equals to that, it's just a parabolic trough. It actually is literally a trough. There is no third order correction to it. It's just straight up that. So, um, in fact, this is kind of a false negative in the sense that the origin is, in fact, a local minimum. Um, you know, but it's kind of a, an interesting sort of local minimum because it's got infinitely many other local minimums nearby. And here's example one, which was a local, an, an honest to goodness local minimum. And there's example two, local maximum. And here's the inconclusive one. But any questions? Yeah. So at some point, should we just kind of look at it from a common sense perspective and say, hey, wait a minute, I know that that's the equation of a um, parabolic cylinder? Sure, but that won't work here. OK. <laughs> yeah. You, no, that is the next mission. So your current mission, you're mostly engaged in finding critical points and or using the method of Lagrange multipliers, which we're already done with, right? The next mission, you take some of those same critical points you're finding right now and you classify them, which would be to use this, this or to use methods of power series to try to just look at it directly. Remember, the second derivative test is really just a way to sort of um, make nice and ugly power series with mixed terms. Like it's, you know, if I could just sort through all the, uh, all the jibber jabber. <clears throat> Basically, the result is this. F is equal to F of the point plus lambda 1 h squared plus lambda 2 k squared plus da 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 da. So like, that, that's essentially what the second derivative test is built on, is the fact that the function basically looks like that at a critical point. So, you know, if you had another example where the formula for the power series was already looking like this, well, you could read whether it's a min or a max off in that kind of case, even if, you, uh, even if it was a function of three variables, you could still be successful in analyzing min max questions. I'll show you. I have an example here in a, sec in a second or two. But let's look at this one before I get onto that. Um, so here's a third order problem, x cubed minus 12xy plus 8y cubed. First of all, we find the critical points. So I take the gradient like that, and I want to solve it equal to 0, right? So I've got two equations i got to solve. i got to solve 3x squared minus 12y equal to 0, and I've got to solve minus 12x plus 24y squared equal to 0, right? So I see that as 4y equal to x squared. And this one gives me x is equal to 2y squared, right? So let's see. If you look at that, what would you do? I think we can just substitute one into the other, right? So that's what I do over here. I trade. I got 4y is equal to 2y squared squared, right? So I'm just taking um, this x squared and replacing it. I'm replacing that x with, with this 2y squared, right? That makes sense? So that gives me 4y is equal to 4y squared. So that gives me, so yeah, then I got y to the fourth minus y equal to zero, canceling the fours, right? The safe way to solve polynomial, polynomial equations, you guys, is to factor, right? Factoring doesn't lose solutions. Dividing by y could be dangerous if you don't, when you divide by y, you get by like, you got to be like, y equal to zero is a solution. I will keep this in mind. I'm dividing by y now and disregarding that solution, right? You could do that, but students who divide by y typically don't do that. They just divide by y and then forget y equals 0 is a solution, right? So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, do not, do not lose the 0 solution. It matters. Factoring is essentially dividing by y and then keeping y. If there's anything we learned from last night's Oscars, it's that every solution should be counted, right? It's diversity in solutions. 
So, let's see here. Um, like hashtag not my polynomial. Let's see here. Um, <laughs> sorry, that, that joke was brought to you by one of my, my Galois theory students. <laughs> a couple of, I, was, I was watching my. Anyway, it's a little story. Um, <clears throat> so, um, y cubed has one real zero, namely one, right? And if you factor that out, this gives you y times y minus one times y squared plus y plus one. But y squared plus y plus one is not, cannot be factored um, as it happens. So anyway, this just has two real solutions, zero and one. And then you can go back and figure out what x had to be, right? x had to be zero or two respectively. So we find two critical points. This is your current homework, is sorting through equations like this, right? You're not alone. You can check your work with Wolfram Alpha, right? You should do that. You know? And your friends? You have friends, right? Whoa. <laughs> Setting Thomas aside, you have friends, right? <laughs> he set that up. I had to use it. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Thomas. Um, oh, no, no, it's all good. I, I was so tickled that you... I was just reading the chemistry of the room, so to speak. But uh, let's see here. I think I made it worse. Let's see here. Critical. Critical points. Sorry, I'm still just bitter for my high school chemistry because we never blew up anything. And I was so looking forward to blowing stuff up. We never did. See, my, my high school chemistry blew stuff up. It's probably why I like chemistry so much. Oh. I mean, I, I did fireworks. I made my own, but you know, that was not part of chemistry. I mean, that is. I know. Ever looked into sparkler bombs? <laughs> sparkler bombs. Sparkler bombs. Look it up. Amazing. <laughs> the idea that you can. Well, the thing is, I grew up in upstate New York, so like the only firework we had legally there were sparklers. These stupid, dangerous metal sparklers <laughs> that burn you. Right? Like the morning glories you get here. Those were. Those were not legal in New York when I was a kid. But here's the ironic thing. If you get a truckload of sparklers, like the safety metal ones, and you bundle them in the right way, you can do, you can, you can do stuff. Look on YouTube. It's there. They'll, there's tutorials. Let's see here. Don't try this at home. It's OK. I'm at college. <laughs> Don't try this at home. It's okay, I'm at college. <laughs> that's, uh, that's fantastic. I like that. That makes sense to me. Let's see here. So in this case, we, count, we find our critical points. There are two of them, 0, 0, and 2, 1. Finally, an interesting critical point, right? And we calculate our second derivatives, x, x, y, y, x, y. Um, then this is my Hessian, 288 times xy minus 144. Now, you can factor out 144, that's actually 2xy minus 1, right? And then I usually like to make a, a table because there gets to be a lot of stuff floating around, right? Some of the examples past this have like five critical points. So presenting your answer in tabular form, I think, is, it starts to become important, right? Um, most of you want to become professionals in some sort of regard, right? So one of the important things you should be thinking about as you take all your classes is how can I present my work in a professional way, right? I cut you a lot of slack on tests and in homework and how you present your work because you're still learning, right? But getting past that, you should always be thinking about how you can present yourself in a professional way. And um, so, like, don't be like I am with grammar in here, right? <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> I'm showing you what not to do. In that, in, that, in that regard. So the critical point, 0, 0, if you, if you plug in 0, 0 here, we get 144, 2 times 0, 0, minus 1, which is just minus 144, right? So the Hessian is minus 144. That's negative. We don't even care what the second derivative is, because once we find the d is negative, it's a saddle point. OK, game over. On the other hand, if I plug in the 2, 1 critical point, like that, that gives me 2 times 1, which is uh, 2. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 minus 1 is 3. 3 times 144 is currently 432. And if you look at the second derivative with respect to x, which one do I plug in? Do I have to plug in x equal to 2, or do I plug in y equal to 1 there? I plug in the 2, so I get 12. Not that it would, you, you can't go wrong here, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, you could, but it would take a lot. Wait, wait. Well, this is particular way. It'd be, it'd be tough to get the sign of x, f, x, x, y wrong. So it's positive, which means that f of 2, 1, which is, by the way, how do I get the minus 8? Yeah. The, yeah, yeah, 
plug the two, which I plug two one into here? Do I plug it into here? <laughs> what do I plug it into? We're talking about the original function, right? The extreme value is we plug it into the original function that gives us the actual extreme value. Um, I believe it's in the extrema. Um, uh, anyway, so minus eight if you plug it back in there. And so there you go. So we conclude by the second derivative test there's only one local extrema. The local uh, minimum value of minus eight is attained at two comma one. And here's a picture. Um, so it's really kind of subtle. The uh, the fact that the origin's a saddle. I, it's I, it's kind of hard. It's you can kind of see it in there. I think. Um, well, actually, here's zero. And here's zero. So the origin's like in here somewhere. So there's like this one direction that you drop off. The other direction, I think you go up like that. So the origin is a saddle, but it's kind of a saddle in a subtle way. Whereas on the other hand, 2, 1, which is over in here somewhere, is a local, a local minimum. But I think if you just went looking for this graphically, it'd be really hard to find, right? Especially because it's all blue. It's all blue, yeah. <laughs> Must be a, it's a, deep, it's a deep state graph. Let's see here. Sorry. All right. Well, I think this is a pretty good... Well, I have some more examples here. Just let me, while we're, we're, we're having this discussion, before I forget, I have another good example where I actually plug in numbers to the Hessian there that I skipped over. This is a function of three variables. We can still follow the heart, the same concept as the analysis here, but we don't have the second derivative test. So I should mention this to you guys. Something like sine of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. We can take the, um, the power series for sine, which is x minus 1 sixth x cubed. And that would give me this minus that, right? So close to the origin, which is a critical point, 0, 0, 0, I can see that this function basically looks like x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So as you think about level surfaces around the origin, they're all leveling up. So the origin is a local minimum on the basis of this power series expansion. Um, let's see here if I have one that's not a local minimum. Ah. I think I skipped over my other easy example. This one. This one would fail. This one would not. Um, I think this one doesn't. Does this one work for my Hessian? Let's see here. Oh, it does. We get d is negative, so it's a saddle. But my point in this example is that, yeah, you could calculate the Hessian for e to the, e to the minus x squared plus y squared, right? Or you could look at the power series expansion. The exponent, this is like exponential of that stuff, so that's 1 minus that stuff plus 1 half times that stuff squared and so forth. So in this case, you can just see from this that the, the, the quadratic piece, the Hessian, is y squared minus x squared. Well, if I've got a difference of squares, that means I can, I can, uh, I can increase from one direction and I can decrease from another, right? If I fix y equal to 0 and I let x go to 0, I'm starting from something more negative to going to 0, so it's increasing. On the flip side, if I put x equal to 0 and I let y go from non-zero to 0, I'm going from something positive to something, something 0. So I decrease in one direction, I increase in another, it's a saddle. But just as a point of order, if I've got a difference of sums of squares, right, then it's going to be a saddle. If I have all sums of squares, it's, it's, a, it's a local minimum. If I have subtraction of all the, if I have like x squared minus y squared minus z squared in a power series expansion, um, about the origin um, for a function of three variables, then it's a local minimum. Assuming, of course, that we're at a critical point, which would, you'd, you'd see from there being no, no first derivative piece in here. So anyway, I'm just trying to say that there, is, there are sort of simple power series examples I ask as challenge questions, right? The center of the course is understanding the second derivative test and applying it, but there's a little bit more in my notes past that that you don't always see. Anyway, I will shut up, and if you guys have questions about your mission, jump in. So tomorrow we're doing closed test, closed set test stuff, right? So like how do you maximize a function on a triangle or something like that? Probably something will work tomorrow. Calculus too, no, no, that's behind us. 
Although, after some of the things I saw in that differential equations test the other week, I'm thinking about taking away their calculus two credit. Like, if I had the power, I might do it. <laughs> so I told them. It's like, you, you say that the integral of a product is the product of the integrals on a 300-level calculus-based math course. No, you don't say that. You don't say that the square root of a plus b is the square root of a plus the square root of b when you're in differential equations. <laughs> no! It is forbidden! <laughs> Same for you guys. Which mission are we on? Which, which mission? Seven. This one, right? So what do you want to know? Number 90, I have, I have been requested. I look at number 90. So I will do that. Can you guys turn on the lights? Uh, lights, please. Thank you, thank you. Did you guys have a good weekend? I know you're all sleepy because you're up late watching the Oscars, but, uh, you know. <laughs> What's our objective, our objective function here? In, in problem, problem 90, our objective function is what? It's sine of x, sine of y sine of z, right? What's the constraint? X plus y plus z equals pi. What's that? Or pi. Uh-huh. Well, th that's the, I mean, that's the, the first thing. So the first thing to decide is, you know, what, what is the constraint, yeah. So if, ahem, you got to be quiet because people can't hear. So just hold on your thoughts. I know there's lots to say here. It's an interesting problem. But if it's a triangle and it's in Euclidean space, then the sum of the angles is pi, right. So we have that. So, you, you know, I'll use pi. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter, really, but yeah, so now you get, yeah, that was the thing is what's the constraint exactly, yeah. This problem is near and dear to my heart because I've asked over constrained triangle problems on tests before and had to throw them out, which was sad. But yes, at this point, you can do it because we have to, uh, you know, we solve gradient of f is equal to lambda times the gradient of g and see where that takes you, right? I will say this, your solutions should be symmetrical, right? right? Like the analysis between x, y, and z, x, y, and z should have the same role. That should be very freeing, the fact that the solution has to be symmetric between x, y, and z. Yep. Um, can you go I can try. Let's see here. Now this one, ah, yes. <laughs> so we have f of r theta, what was it equal to? I've already forgotten. Yes, these are polar coordinates. Yeah. So don't do this. Uh, yeah. I'm, yes. Well, that is also true. Um, the, these are polar coordinates. Thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, I mean, I could give it to you in terms of x and y if that would be. No, I just mean like whether you could interpret those as just different names for x and y. Yeah. I mean, this. Sense. You should understand this. This is the formula given in polar coordinates. I was trying to figure out a good way to express that notation. Really, and I couldn't figure it out. Well, this was my choice, but yeah. yeah. Um, well, I mean, f of r comma theta is the same. same so we have derived last week that the gradient of f was r hat, partial f, partial r, plus theta hat, 
1 over r partial f partial theta, right? So do I need to write more? I mean, I don't. So all you got to do is just calculate these partial derivatives and plug them in there. And that, that will at least give you a formula for the gradient. Now you want to find the critical points, right? Now I will, I will help you out. I shouldn't tell you guys this, but it's too late. This is e to the minus r plus theta quantity squared, yeah? Oh, I'm sorry. So if you, if you write it like that, it's, it's easy, you'll get better formulas down here. You will. It's very and um, so basically what's going to happen is that you'll get, well, I shouldn't say more. If, no. you did this, if I did this problem correctly, you get a really interesting critical point. But you want to you wanna set this equal to zero for critical points, right? And I would encourage you to express those critical points in polar coordinates. That's the natural thing to do. Yeah, yeah it's kind of messy. Hmm. I wonder if you get the same answer with the, uh, your way of thinking. You're uh, thinking. Uh, oh, that's actually good. I think well, you I might guess, still. I guess not because of the 1 over r, right? Because like, you're, you're, saying, you're saying that sort of if you think of r and theta as, as Cartesian variables. Right, because like, I'm used to like, yeah. historically like, thinking of things, variables as hmm. different names as the same. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, yes, I know. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So you could convert to Cartesian coordinates, but then... See, I'm thinking, yeah, like, the way I wrote it that. for... Like, no, you don't want to do that. It's written <laughs> as f of r cosine theta, r, That'd be r cosine theta, instead. That's 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 that just seems kind of weird. Hmm. Other questions? This one, this one actually, it, uh, it, it looks complicated, but it's really beautifully simple when you get to the answer. At least, assuming I did it right. That's what I'm aiming for, but... Yes, questions? How about 89? Maximize that on the sphere. So the objective function, of course, is what? x plus 2y plus 2y. 2x plus 2y plus oh, 3y. 5z on, this, on, on uh, just this x squared plus uh, y squared plus z squared equal to, uh, what was it? 19. So this is, so basically what I, what I want to try to solve, the gradient of f is equal to lambda times the gradient of g. This is my g, right? So that means I have to solve 2, 3, 5 equals lambda times 2x, 2y, 2z. So that would give me three equations, right? 2 is equal to 2 lambda x. 3 is equal to 2 lambda y. 5 is equal to 2 lambda z. I would solve for lambda. Lambda is equal to uh, 1 over x, I guess. Lambda is equal to... Yeah. Well, I don't know if I'd do it that way. I mean, I don't know. There's different ways to do algebra here. Uh, 5 over 2z, I suppose. But these are equal, right? So then would you just set them equal and then put them back into the quadratic? Or into the x squared, y squared, z squared? Um, well, what do you want to keep? Right, so just... So this, this equation is more usefully written. x um, is equal to 2 thirds y, right? And this guy is more reasonably written, I guess I should, I don't know. X is what? 2 fifth z. I mean, you, you pick your poison. Um, so I can, I can take these, right? And I'm also solving this subject to x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals to 19, right? So your goal is to get an equation that just has x, just has y, or just has z in it, right? So you can use these two, right? Um, yeah, I probably should solve this for z, right? Z is equal to 5 halves x, yeah? If 
probably should have solved that one for, I probably should have solved this for x equal to, I mean, y equal to what? If I do that, then I can get rid of my z for x, I can get rid of my y for x, then I'll have x squared left. So you're going to get two x values now? Yeah, I get two x values, and from those two x values, I will get two y values and two z values. Well, I don't know. Would this have a question? Will this have a... Uh, I asked you to maximize it, right? Yeah. But you should find maximums and minimums because the sphere is, in fact, compact. It's, it's, it doesn't go on and on. It's got no fuzzy edges. Yep. I shouldn't really write more. <laughs> <laughs> if I've made a mistake, please tell me. I don't want to misinform those others. This is what inadvertently happens when I give this much help on homework, is I make some kind of stupid arithmetic mistake, you know? And then the rest of you, like, suffer because of my stupidity. And, like, so this is why I try to be a little bit vague about homework, as to not propagate my own inability to add fractions in class to you on the homework. But, um, Other questions? Yeah, lambda's pretty lambda's lambda's pretty much a throwaway here, right? I could try. Ah, so seventy nine. What you want to do is to look at f. F is equal to all right. We're going to use polar coordinates. That's a pol that, 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 that smacks the polar coordinates, right? So, what we do is say f is equal to r squared. Cosine of what's the inverse tangent of y over x? Theta. So this is r squared. So we can assume that the r tangent of the tangent is equal to the value? Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. <clears throat> Otherwise, <clears throat> excuse me, it'd be plus pi, I suppose, or minus pi. It'd be interesting to see how that changes the answer, but I'm just looking for, for this. So what, what 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 Sam is suggesting is a uh, is a is a bonus solution to the problem, which is fine. But um, yeah, so <clears throat> I'm trying to get at here is once you know this, right? Then the way to calculate is this again. Oh, do I have a z over r? Now the second one, oh, okay. we should look at that as, the second one is rho squared, cosine of what? Uh, theta, theta. theta. What's the last thing, though? And that's um, z over rho and z. What is z over rho? Rho cosine. Yeah. That's cosine, that's cosine of phi, right? Cosine of the co-latitude. At which point you go and use the formula that we found all the many errors in my notes for, for the uh, derivation at least. But the, the end result's right, the uh, gradient in, in spherical coordinates, right? Yeah. I remember this much. Okay, I'm just kidding. I, I do remember a little bit more. Um, I believe it was... Is this right? Yeah. I believe. I don't remember the other. Oh, no, I think it's one over rho sine v. One over rho. Yeah. One over rho. One over rho. Yeah. Yes. Am I right? Yep. 50 50. I know it's either. <laughs> but geometrically, this makes sense to me for various reasons that I'll talk more about later in the course. But. Well, it looks like I'm out of battery, so class is over. <laughs>